Anne's tie is with Turles is Turles actually saved his life. <laughs> 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 Don't, don't, don't say it out now. Don't just keep, keep this in your head now for a minute until I, until I like, I do this and I do this. Then, so think of a descriptive word, right? Do you, do you have one in your head? A descriptive word, like so yeah. any adjective. Any, any, any adjective. Okay. Right. Welcome back to everything from Northern Ireland's Lewis. Lewis podcast. <laughs> that is so weird. I went through this in my head earlier, and I said, "What if he says a color?" And then, ah, oh, no. But yeah, welcome back to Ireland's Lewis podcast. <laughs> Um, yeah, today's guest is John McFadden. I don't know where to start. I was going to write down kind of the extensive list of things he's done. Um, it's pretty much he's been involved in all sectors of the music industry from being involved in organising festivals, the many roles that are um, keep a festival going. He's been involved. He teaches um, many like music sub based subjects. He taught me music business. That's kind of how we had this connection. And he... Um, I think you've done nearly everything it got to do with music, apart from, as far as I know, do you even make, do you make music? You see, I do all this because I don't make music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head there straight away. That's good. You know? So you, yeah. have you ever played music? I, I picked up a guitar because I wanted to be cool, and yeah, yeah. I wasn't very good. No, no one told me you needed to play guitar many, many times over, like 10,000 hours or whatever it is, yeah, yeah. you know, to become an expert. So I never did that. Um, but what I will say, all the instruments I did pick up, like obviously guitar, tried the piano, but the one that actually felt the most natural was the violin. Oh, no way. Yeah. And you kind of stay at it or just kind of... Clearly I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, that was the one. If I was picking one up again, it probably would be the violin. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you, like, you've, like, um, how many years do you have experience in the music industry? Jesus. I uh, started as a teenager. Okay. So it's two years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so God, we're going back to the, honestly, we're going back to the very late 80s, you know? Okay. So that's when I... Mm. Kind of and how did you get so, like, what kind of started your involvement in the music industry was it you, do you know what depending on what into you go back on you'll hear different versions of this but it probably started if i'm honest back when i was a kid my parents were a big fan it was a huge hit single in arms like number one for over a year called like one day at a time by a country artist called gloria and um my parents brought me to this festival in a field in rose and alice in county leash and i think that was probably the very beginning of it you know, because there was this big stage and there was this huge star. Now, I didn't know what a huge star was, but you felt the vibe of the huge star. Mm, yeah. you know? So I think that's kind of where it started, uh, really. Um, music was a lot played in the, in the house, but none of my family were musicians. And then what happened was kind of when I hit teenage years, it was people I knew who were having success. Uh, Monday from Borough, for example, mm. was in yeah. secondary school with him. But if we go back a step before that, it would be when um, I was in school with Tony McCarroll, the original drummer from Oasis. And you know, beyond that, yeah. What, what were you in primary school with uh, two of the members of uh, two of the members of Oasis? Who was the other one? Yeah, the other one might have been Liam Gallagher. <laughs> what are the chances? And how, how did how, how did that connection happen? Is that just the craziest coincidence that you were in? Because yeah. that was in a primary school in, in Manchester, that was in Manchester with yeah. Liam Gallagher, and then yeah. the other one was in a primary school in Offaly, correct? Yeah, with, with the yeah. drummer of Oasis. Yeah, how what's yeah. the crack? Yeah, yeah, and to be fair, this does sound like I'm making it up. Yeah. No, no, I know yeah. it is. It is, it is, it is real. I've seen um, that. I've, uh, yeah. it's like, yeah. I was looking it up about it, like, and it's just like, how was that just a mad coincidence? Like, were you the connection for them, or how? Uh, what was, let's go with that. I was the connection. How, <laughs> how <laughs> no oasis. Yeah, yeah. You know? um, no, actually, what happened would be. I suppose in Manchester there's an Irish community, do you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. everyone I suppose hung out in the Irish clubs and all the rest of it. And I just happened to be in the same, again it was a religious based school, so I was in the same school as Liam Gallagher, okay. which is um, St. Bernard's, and um, that's I suppose how I ended up in school there with him. But what's actually interesting was many years later in one of the red top like newspapers, there was this kind of picture, now I had gone at this stage, there were, there were maybe 10 or 11 at this stage, the, that class. And there was a guy in it, I won't name him, to be fair, but the guy, my very first best friend, was there and it was describing what everyone had done with themselves since. And he was in jail, you know? Yeah. So I said, if I'd have stayed in Manchester, I'd have either been an oasis or jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gamble. That's you know, a good gamble. Possibly Which just well. Yeah. Well, uh, the Tony McCarroll, the, the, the drummer part of then, would be years ago when my mother went to Manchester. She went with um, uh, her friend called uh, Bridie O'Donnell. 
So Bridie O'Donnell's, uh, that I've said it the wrong way, Mary O'Donnell, Mary O'Donnell's sister was Bridie O'Donnell, who of course is Tony McCarroll's mother. So when she came from Kennedy over to Manchester, she obviously stayed with my mother and her sister. Yeah. So um, but years later, they moved back to Ireland. That's Tony McCarroll's parents, back to where I'm from, the village. And they lived there for two years. And at that point in time, Tony was then in Kennedy National School. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Yeah. And he is so. still in touch with any of the, either of the guys? Well, I, I put it this way, like I don't even remember Liam Gallagher, mm. to be quite honest. But obviously, I, I would have played with him, but didn't even know I played with him. Yeah, 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 of course, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, yeah, absolutely. Was Tony, in contact with Tony all the time, all mm. the way through. Uh, Pre-Oasis, during Oasis, and of course, after Oasis. And as you know, Tony, um, as a successful tour going now, kind of definitely made mm. the 25-year anniversary thing, you know? And there's some exciting stuff happening with that again this year, but that's Tony's story to tell. Maybe, maybe you'll come and do this. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, that'd yeah, be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Are they getting back together? They're going to at some stage. Yeah, it's not yeah, that mind. It's, it's a matter of yeah, choice, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know? The money um, will be get to the just the right point. Yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A good build up. I think Ego will do it too. I think because yeah. the two boys, when they can do a stadium tour, and I don't know if either of them individually can do a stadium tour. Again, yeah. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? They'll do, they'll do arena tours, no problem. Mm. But I think the ego will get to them. Yeah. They're probably going to get better for saying this. But, and they'll go, yeah, we've got an offer, the money's right, and we're going to be playing to 80,000, 100,000 people a night. Well, I think that's what will yeah. get them back, yeah. I think. You know? Yeah. Um, the what a great it, time. But the arrogance is great. It just might not happen. It might not happen. <laughs> I'd love for it to happen. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. need the money. There yeah, is yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But do you know what? Like all of us here, I think, have been lucky enough to be on a stage, not necessarily playing an instrument in my case, at least, but I've been behind, like, you know, some of the bunny rabbits that have been on stage with uh, flaming lips, you know? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, and you yeah, see, like, 8,000 people staring up at you. Hmm. And you can't think the energy you feel. It's hmm. weird, and like that's yeah, yeah like as you, you say, know? that's just from someone working there. Yeah, yeah imagine yeah. being on the stage and you know they're directly looking at you. Singing like, your song, yeah. holy, like that. Yeah. It is intense. Like, you I know? think um, do you know, like the whole like that's a massive talk right now, and hopefully it becomes even more of a talk. But it's the whole like, like the what what an artist experiences after they go back to the hotel room, and it's a big yes. reason why like drugs are heavily involved in the music industry. Sure. But it's kind of like um. The feeling they get from going from like fifty thousand people yeah. looking at them cheering their name to this kind of quiet hotel room, yeah. like and they can just hear the immersion or something. I don't know. Like, but. well, it's great. It's because it is coming to the forefront at the moment, and especially with technicians in the industry, it's 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 a massive, massive problem. It's yeah, uh, yeah like um, England are just starting to look at it. Australia are looking at it. Ireland, unfortunately, we're a wee bit behind. Yeah, sure. um, but it is becoming. Like a lot more people know about it now, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's going to become regulated, and hopefully, people will be able to access help a little bit uh, yeah. easier, you know. So it's uh, it's 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 a really tough it's thing, and it's, thing. yeah, yeah. And I think as well because like a lot of the artists and a lot of people that kind of have a profile, like it's hard for them to complain about it because people will turn around and say, oh, "You have all this money and stuff like that." So I guess it's like mm. it's a really weird thing for an yeah, artist to. Mm. to Loads of people complain. struggle with transitions, even if they're not famous. Like transitions between, like you know, even some people going from work to home, even if it's yeah. not in front of Absolutely, thousands yeah. of people. Some people will be like in a sour mood for a little bit when they come home, and then once they kind of get used to being back home, they're grand. Yeah. and that kind of thing. So it's like, you think of if you just put that on a bigger scale, the amount, like the the drop you're going to feel from that is going to be yeah. intense. Thing. There's some there's some great things you do. Well, how I used to deal with it, say in like a music industry lecture or whatever, there was an article. Uh, by one of the guys who was crew for Bastille. And the only reason I picked that was I had a former student who was part of Bastille's crew. Now, it mm. wasn't him specifically. Yeah. And he spoke of his experience all the way through, you know, the, the, the huge high all the way down to, I think he referred to them as demons in the article. Mm. And that's what I used to do. I used to literally read it word for word, purely because I'm not a psychologist or whatever. Mm, yeah. But the point was saying, look, this is a very real aspect of this industry yeah. that you're in. Mm. Do you know that kind of way? Yeah. Um, I remember the first college album launch we did um, for uh, DFEI way back when, geez, in the mid 90s. And I remember, because it was the first one, at this stage we knew it was going to chart because we had the, the, the midweek chart predictions and all the rest. And um, I do remember that night going back to the hotel room because I said um, we had it in the green room, that it doesn't exist anymore. It used to be a holiday in Pier Street. Um, it's a modern hotel, I think, now. And. Um, I remember going back to the room and like that it was like this huge high yeah. to absolute nothing mm. um, yeah it was, it was and that was only like that was only a college album but it was yeah, because yeah. it was accumulation 
of everything that we've done over the six mm. months leading to that night. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of but way. the industry does have a massive anticlimactic nature, ah. like yeah. and it's oh, really yeah. tough to well, you know, I, get your I head around. Like it's the whole like everything has its like every like mm. reaction has its opposite. Like it's like when you're gonna experience like that high, like you're gonna go down or that low, and it is mm. this very. It's not a very flat line industry, even from the extent to like what you do, which is you're working. Yeah. Like you're either like home relaxing, which isn't even that often, but but when you're working, you're working, and it's like oh, and then you might be kind of down it, for it. A bit, it, it takes time. You have like like you spend all your time learning the instrument. Yeah. But you don't learn the tools to actually, to, to, to you know, like the tools, the other tools that yeah. you need, yeah. like how to cope, coping yeah. mechanisms and stuff like that. That's mm. a talent in itself. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. That should be a module. Oh, yeah, it should fair. be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, I'm getting on, but like, you know, you know the way you've been an artist liaison as well. Yes. What's the weirdest thing you've been asked hey. for? <laughs> Gee, um, you know, there's been nothing really that weird. It's actually very normal in that. No green M and M's or anything like that. No, nothing like that at all. Um, there's there's been situations of kind of the opposite. Is that you would be warned that certain artists are going to maybe throw, you know, a kind of a hissy fit, mm. yeah. and they don't, and you're kind of surprised yeah. that they don't. Mm. Um, I, nothing really. It's actually really sad that there's nothing there. There was one particular artist who played at a very big festival in Ireland many moons ago who did all right, wanted toilet that nobody else had used. How dare they? Which, which is kind of a, a strange request in a field. You know, mm. to be fair. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we, we won't name that particular artist, but that artist is still going. We were, um, we like, uh, an event we were doing uh, before, um, I can say its name, or not going to say the artist's <laughs> name, or anything, or, but we, like, I was dealing with, like, a, uh, they're an English agency, like, and I was dealing with booking this artist over from somewhere in England, and, um, but yeah, they were getting flights over, but, like, they, they, they as you're saying, it was the opposite, like, they, 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 list of what was requested for the green room was like his own uh, private dressing room all his mad stuff and i was like and you instantly assume because it's my mm. first time dealing with it i instantly assumed i was like this guy must be like not who he thought he was at all like and then like we expected all and then he said look we can't provide any of that and they were like oh that's grand so he still came over and mm. he this guy would have slept in ditches like he would like do you know what i mean he was just yeah, like yeah. like a real open not like do you know what i mean he would like he was very content as well i'm trying to get i yeah. this is a very weird way to go about saying that but he was very content just very chill guy but this list of what he's manager yes managers were requesting mm. was insane no there's there is sometimes a couple of things that they do like an artist for example will ask for a hotel room with a bat and it's not necessarily they want a bat in the room at all. But often in certain hotels, if it has a bat, it's a bigger room. So mm. therefore you get a better room. Ah, mm. right. Sometimes the whole green M&M type thing is yeah. really more about... Do you know what a story behind reading. that? It's about if you read the, the writing. Yeah. It's checking. It's a, it's a control mechanism, really. Yeah, yeah. What was the band that you was know? for again? Oh, I remember. God. Massive band. It where the whole group, the M&M thing started. But it yeah, was basically yeah. that, like, the reason they requested... Have Grateful all, Dead, was it? Or it was one of those. It was around that time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was way yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why they requested to have all the brown M&Ms, and this is such a big thing now, but why they requested the, the brown M&Ms to be taken is because they wanted to see... Uh, if the the book and the promoters were actually reading the list, so if the first thing they seen in the dressing room was that there was brown M and M's, they were prepared for yeah. kind of a mess up Brilliant. on the show. Like yeah, yeah. so, like what seemed to be really pretentious was actually just genius. Like because they were checking, they were, it was a kind of a check even for the tech writer. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. That beyond mm. the the hospitality one, you know. Um, and again, for anyone who's listening, the writer is just a term used for a list of requirements of the bass, whether it's on the technical side or indeed whether it's on the yeah. the like the hospitality, i.e., sweets, drinks, that kind of thing. So yeah, we had to cut this part out. Um, I accidentally leaked some valuable information. Um, what was it? Oh yeah, this part I actually accidentally said that how the pyramids were made. Yes, that was it. I accidentally said, I accidentally leaked the, the unknown information about how the pyramids in the pyramids of Giza were actually constructed. So we had to cut this out. Um, yeah, it's not that we can tell you how the pyramids were constructed. It's more so kind of like we don't want to kind of take away the mystery. Um, you know, we're just, we're just a local podcast in Turles. We don't want to take away the mystery of the world of such an amazing wonder. Literally, it's a wonder. Um, yeah, Adam, yeah. What's your feel on the current state of... We'll, we'll stick with the Irish music industry as of now. Like, how... Or, kind of... 
Well, we'll actually talk about um, what's your opinion on the way people are consuming music differently now, like, mm -hmm. or how they're, I suppose, when I went on the phone briefly the other day, you were kind of talking about the, um, what was the stat you just read about the number one the selling stat, album? The stat, the number one selling album, it was actually in the UK, the number one selling album in the UK, it either sold just below or just over a thousand copies. And that, I think, was only downloads, not even physicals were in it. Oh. However, it was at number one. It had the equivalent of 24,000 sales from streams. Mm. And the one that had sold the most was 17. There was the number three record had sold the most of the top three records had sold the most actual albums um, around 17,000. And you're counting, hang on now a second. How can the album that's only sold 1,000 be number one yeah. and the album that sold 17,000 be number three? And it's got to do with the streaming and the streaming charts. Now, the charts are supposed to reflect what people are consuming. But where I think there's a, a, a bit of a, a gap there is I would doubt the number one artist is going to make the same amount of money on the 24,000 notional sales yeah. compared to the 17,000 real sales. Mm, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And I kind of think that really, rather than, there's a lot of awkward equations. I can't remember the exact figures. Somewhere between, say, 3,000 and 1,000 plays of an album equates to one sale but it does not equate to the same money mm. that you'd earn yeah. from one sale of an album and I think that should be reflected in a record that's getting to record comes from age, uh, in, in a product that gets the number one yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, I think that's yeah so it's a, but that's based on the, on the playlists as well that um, again who's providing the playlists who are the major music people uh, yeah, who there's owns there's so many other factors you now know, it's so yeah yeah because it's so accessible and it's so easy to promote, like it's, I don't know, it's, it's cheap, it's obviously cheaper now to promote like the music on that, because like once it, you just kind of have to figure a way to get it out to the people and you kind of yeah. let the people take it from there, You're, like. I think it was Vol Wolfpack that used streaming to their advantage where it was like, uh, they wanted to fund, I could be wrong, it might have been them, but I think it was. They put up like an album of silence and the idea was yes, all their fans had to listen to it while they slept on repeat. Yeah. So it wouldn't actually make any sound and they could just right. repeatedly listen to that and then the money gathered from streaming that went towards funding no their album. Brilliant. Did, they, did that, was that successful? Like, I think so, yeah. Wow. I, was, I was reading something about it lately. I think, it was, I think it was Wolfpack. Like, That's genius. Remember. But then you had recently, you had Justin Bieber. Do you see that campaign? I shared that on my Facebook um, profile, actually, where he actually told fans what he wanted them to do so he could have a number one. Oh, yeah, he's, wow. he's really, really adamant on Yomi becoming number one. He's like, do this, do that. that song, yeah, yeah. He said, play it on repeat over and over again. Like, yeah. basically make a playlist that's only that sure song. Make sure it wasn't on mute, that I had to have a volume or it wouldn't count. Like, mm. he had all the... It was very interesting. He had all the insider industry things that, in theory... All of us industry people will know no, yeah. Yeah, that we yeah. don't actually vocalize. Mm. Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? And he did it. I thought, geez, that was brave because he really did. He vocalized all the tricks mm. of the trade, really. Mm. I suppose with someone like him, because he has such a large fan base, kind of, and he really get loyal fans, yeah. Yeah. he would get away with it because he'd be like, yeah. yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's not like he, it doesn't come across that he's being dodgy. It's like that's kind of how streams work. Like he just kind of, well, there was he's one, just being there, blunt. Like, there was one thing about what you saying, was it saying using uh, VPNs and stuff? I like, God, I'm surprised. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised you're saying things like that and stuff. No, it was something like that, you know? <laughs> Um, but um, people so, also yeah. are li definitely listen, living in an age where people aren't as fooled as easy anymore. So like I think a part of that could have been as well as like, well at least he's being honest. Like rather than trying to sell up all these subliminal ways to get us to play it, he's just saying do this. Like rather than all yeah. these kind of. So people are probably like, yeah, sure. He's at least he's being honest. Like well, he is. <laughs> and and to be fair, it's his team. It's not just him. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's mm. going to be the manager oh, sure, behind yeah. the yeah. Gonna say, well, look. He wouldn't wait, like kind of waste his time thinking about it. Like, really. Yeah, yeah. He's just he's looking for the royalties coming in off Spotify. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So I think what I would say to anyone who's listening right now, and if you're looking for chart success, now I don't know if chart success is is one of the key things. Like 10, 15 years ago, I would have been very much saying use the charts and the chart success thing purely to profile yourself. Yeah. Um, as as to be not misconstrued or or conflicted with uh, an ego trip thing, but mm. rather, it was always the way. If you had a hit your fee went up and that was the whole point of having a hit mm. I think that has changed right now but if I was working with somebody who wanted a hit I'll be honest with you I would be really pushing for a streaming campaign you know yeah. wouldn't be ignoring the likes of physical product or, or download per se but I would be really looking at playing yeah, sure. streaming and 
Old Town Road wouldn't wouldn't have been number one as long as it was in our streams. Like, and it's yeah. like that's now the longest running number one of all time. Like, since yeah, they, since the, since they started nice. taking record in the sixties, like, it was what was it? Mm. I can't remember how many weeks it was, but it was like three or four months. Like. Yeah, I think, I think it was three, like 12, 12 weeks or something like that. Mm. Like, I think there's there's more. Like, I think you see the industry are still trying to tweak it because they're they're going without maybe uh, already boring maybe your your viewers and listeners, but it's like kind of that. Um, they've realised that you have to be like Mr. Brightside. I think is still in the charts for about uh, mm. five hundred years now. Yeah, and it's kind of, <laughs> and it's like there, there's there's rules that they put in now that I think if if a song drops for X amount of periods of time in, in weeks, even if it plays, even yeah. if it is getting the plays, they're going to drop it out of the charts. It's okay. kind of a negative kind of thing if it does yeah, drop right. or whatever. So it's still a kind of a way. I think they're attempting to be somewhat fair. But yeah. they can't figure out where that. There's so many other elements. Yeah. So many elements. Into it. Like it's so absolutely. complex. Yeah, it's way too complex to be able to. But it was interesting. Go back to Oasis. Um, way back in the nineties, I remember they had half a dozen songs in the charts. And what's impressive about that? What's impressive about that, is people were going in to record stores and yeah. buying records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm. and that was for so long. You know, it, it was it was a remarkable period in my life as a music fan. Do you remember that ad? Uh, Gal- the Galway ad where the guy keeps going in and keeping yeah, yeah, yeah. Go- 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 Galway and putting him in the boot <laughs> 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 to keep him at the right. top like. keep him in the charts yeah it was great like how um, did you transform you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting transition from, yeah. do you know transition from uh, uh, just your general music industry uh, roles into teaching in it it was actually by pure chance what happened was I went back to college and I was doing a master of arts degree in public relations and I was specialising in the music industry and I had done so I had been at this point prior to that I had been I was a music manager at the time and prior to that I had been the DJ in the in the local hall in Kennedy same hall that Tony McCarroll did his first gig (laughs) exercises and very famous hall Uh, (laughs) but um, infamous Uh, but uh, in any case I was working then when I was finishing up in the masters that time I was working in the PR Institute and I got a phone call from um, the the first college I worked for Dunleary and um, so it was the deputy principal at the time and he said are you the same John McFadden who was a student here because I was it was the year there back in the in the 90s and because um, I did a diploma in, in international trade and marketing and um, I said I am yeah he said what are you doing now and I said uh, I'm doing a master's in PR in the music industry and I hadn't the sentence out and he said would you deliver four hours of music industry studies a week for us mm. and I thought to myself are you going to pay me <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is yeah. amazing you know so immediately I said yes I was in a job I accepted another job without yeah. even considering if I'm on a sorry PR industry without even considering that at that point in time and sure I, I then took it it became you know, yeah, so, job. Geez, where are we so that's okay oh yeah so getting, getting moving from sort of the industry into education so, so you yeah. so that, that course nearly killed you though didn't it <laughs> <laughs> and it was a thrillless yeah. man who saved oh, yeah. you yeah. Well, well, a holy cross man it was a holy cross man indeed it was, it was yeah, like, I just said that the reason like because so far all of our guests have kind of had ties with Turles if you're wondering what John's tie is with Turles is Turles actually saved his life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is my tie but yeah. it was holy cross uh, you know oh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. holy cross Turles has around the areas yeah it's around the what's the definition of Turles so uh, going back to that first night we were talking about in the, the mental health thing the album launch thing mm. so no wonder it was weird going back to the hotel room that night what happened was um, um, running up to that day it was like the first time we'd done a, a, an album launch Donica Ryan from Holy Cross mm. was one of the key students that particular year and um, you probably know Keith Killen as well mm. he would have been one of the others so there's a number of students who came in and they helped us set up we did line checks and all the rest of it but the day had been challenging. Well, the whole period had been challenging, but that particular day was challenging. We were supposed to have a small little van. Do you know what? Those kind of post vans hired. Yeah. Anyway, somebody crashed it. So I um, went to the rental car company. They had no van. You only had the transit, big high roof transit van. And um, there was the argument then they want the charges for a transit. I said, no, I booked a small one because there was a tight budget. Yada, yada, yada. Got the big van. And like everything was literally doing a dance in the back of this transit because... Yeah. It was huge, and we, mm. we didn't have that much, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, drunk it and all the rest. But um, anyway, went to drive in then into the car park of this hotel slash venue, <laughs> and literally just before I went in, I, st- I braked because I remember that this really high roof. I was going to rip the roof off the van, and the reason I was driving into the car park was because they had a great lift which brought the equipment up 
behind the stage. It was mm. like, like the set out because we'd done the recce. It was going to be it's going to be an easy gig, you know. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we we didn't do that. We moved the van outside, brought it in through the front. But a lot of things like that had kind of you know challenges on the day. But we didn't need any of these challenges. So anyway, at the end of that, it was myself, Donica Ryan, uh, Keith Killen, a guy called William Byrne. God, there may have been somebody else there now, and they're not going to. It could have even been Kevin Keane from Fan Club. Actually, yeah, Kevin was. I think, there, was, I think Kevin he was there. Keane, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Kevin, you're getting the credit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so anyway, we we were there, and um, we were having some teeth. So the next thing, anyway, I ordered a burger. I don't know if you've ever done this, because I was in company. I was being a bit, I suppose, I don't know, pretentious. And I was yeah. kind of eating the burger, like, with a knife and fork, as opposed to, like, you know, yeah, yeah. how you should eat a burger. <laughs> like, that's what you get. <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> yeah, just, just don't be pretentious. And I remember I was looking, and this burger was coming right into my mouth. And slow like, motion. Slow motion. And I was thinking, this is too big. But I was going ahead, I, I was, I was hungry. You know? Yeah. Keith Killen, any of you know him, he's, he's uh, very much involved in, I think he's Gavin James, tour manager mm-hmm. at home. And um, <laughs> he told the joke, he's a very funny guy. So instantly, <laughs> st- stuck here. So we're messing at this stage. And everybody thought I was messing. Jesus. You know, I wasn't. Yeah. I was actually dying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, it's a fine line. It's a fine dying line. Dying <laughs> so uh, anyway, yeah, there I am. There I am dying. Apparently, my face went very red, and then when it kind of started going bluish, Donica thought he better do something about it. So it was Donica, as I call it, performed the Heineken maneuver, <laughs> which dislodged said piece of burger, and I'm here wow. today. And all due to Donica. Now he'd be a tiny bit embarrassed about me telling this story. Um, Doesn't like kind yeah. of the the pro, what the what saving lives kind of. He, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's he's very humble. Yeah, okay, you know, yeah right. uh, he, He's modest. He wouldn't like. He wouldn't like. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, He'll probably like it, but he won't like it. At yeah, the same yeah. Time, <laughs> you know, that kind of way. So that's the, definitely that's the terrible, terrible connection. Yeah. So. Uh, but I did say that particular. Oh yeah. What well, um. When we were talking on the phone briefly, you said something, I started laughing when you were like, uh, what was it? it was, uh, we were talking about, you know, all the kind of like, um, what's behind, like, you know, what's going on with uh, the new ways of people uh, streaming content and stuff like that. And you just said, yeah, I think you said something like you think people are actually forgetting to actually make the music. Like, what do you think about um, people kind of, I suppose there being so much focus on, I think people yeah. wanting to make music opposed to create music. Does that make sense to me? Word and that weird. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of people, I don't, I don't think there's this kind of, do you think there's less natural music being made? Like, I'm trying to word, word Is that there. the argument it's, that people it's, are looking to be celebrity before? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. What comes with it opposed yeah. to. They'll be, put more effort into building the platform than actually making yeah. their own. Mm. So they could end up with like loads of followers and then they release the album and everyone's just kind of like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And actually, just kind of it'll tie into that as well. What's your opinion on someone who has lots of experience with brands and marketing and stuff of this new wave of people wanting to make themselves into a brand? What do you think about oh, that? Oh, God. Look, from a marketing viewpoint <coughs> and from a branding viewpoint, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. From a creative artist point, there's a big issue. Yeah. There is a balance in between art versus the business. Always has been, probably always will be. <clears throat> I don't have a massive issue, say, with somebody turning out a, you know, a, a three-minute or four-minute song that's going to be played on radio or put on, on online playlists or yeah. anything like that. And you can have your you know, six to ten-minute kind of song with a guitar solo on your album. Yeah. Because that, you know, the, the three-minute radio-friendly radio, song yeah. is mm. going to you know, provide what I call, I define, you probably remember me saying this, um, the whole, you know, the majority of people who listen to music are music likers, they're not music yeah, lovers. Mm. You know, so it's only, they're interested in a few key songs and it's the diehard fan base care about the album and, mm. yeah. you know, that kind of, you know, additional releases, we'll call them B-sides. I said to B-sides to some students recently, so they didn't include what I meant, you know. And it was years ago, when singles, you know, the A-side was what went to the radio and the flip side of that was a B-side, a non-album track normally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they you looked at me as if I was kind of, crazy I, I also said EMI recently somebody said what's EMI wow. said, you're kidding me you know <laughs> that's where all the quirky stuff was as well you know, you say, a lot of quirky yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff well what is EMI <laughs> it's record company oh, no. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 it's gone but thank you yeah. and I'm glad you said that it's cool <laughs> but I, I, I think there is the trade off but I think it, you know at the end of the day you still have to write great songs if there's no great songs yeah. it doesn't matter if it's hip hop crime indie rock pop whatever it won't work and even the songs yeah, yeah yeah limitations can also bring out creativity as well. Mm. 
Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. When you have too many options, it's, it's very difficult as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's a massive the choice in the speech. That was that was issue. one thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That was one thing uh, when I was in college. Jorgen Simpson said, "Yeah, you you're only allowed to use three notes, and you have to make a four minute piece." And nice. it was so hard, but it was it was really good fun. Actually, yeah, because awesome. you said mm. three notes, do you know you're beautiful by James Blunt? Mm. The verse of that only uses three notes, and it's just because it's just like uh, what was it? It's like because it's like da 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 da. Like that's the same two notes over and over again, and like that song sold millions. And in the whole verse, I think there's three three different notes, and the whole song maybe five different notes. Yeah, but you know how it's because all those people like they needed to be told they were beautiful, like they are beautiful. But like I think that was a big part of it as well. Like it was a good two solid words that you really sold. Like I think many people. I don't think was that the first song they ever actually just sing to the. I suppose kind of um, yeah it's true just to yeah. sing like you're beautiful <laughs> Sorry. Like, yeah. and like when you hear that like people are like whoa like, this guy's mm. talking to me like it's, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of songs kind of doing that now is like that well that was like um well I suppose that was that big I don't know it's kind of died down now but the Ed Sheeran kind of phase of like singing to singing to I can't remember it was a comedian talking about how vague that like Justin Bieber songs are and it's, oh, it's like, Paul Burnham. I like the way yeah he's like, I like the way you have hair and yeah I it's like, like um, you have eyes oh, lousy oh, <laughs> <laughs> Justin Bieber wasn't singing to you no, no he wasn't he, he was not <laughs> sorry yeah. you, you know that's an interesting one because the, where, where like, modern music is like there is a lot of there's the lack is where the hits seem to be, in a way, you know, yeah. um, the, the, the more generic kind of, I don't know, yeah. slag off a lot of people that way, musicians, mm. because obviously what people are selling, this kind of, even sometimes melody is sort of missing, I think, mm, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, you know, music nowadays, but again, you have to factor in, I'm of an age, that I define songs, I, I, I would always try and, what I'd say, remain contemporary, mm. but, you know the old question, what know? is music? Yeah, good question. You know, but the whole thing is, what is music yeah. to you? What Correct. is it to you? It's yeah. completely different to everybody, yeah, you know. Mm. So it's completely subjective, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, it changes with age groups as well, yeah. like, you know, so. Yeah. Because you mentioned, like, melody as well. I was watching things lately, you were talking about, like, the, the death of melody in music. Yeah. Um, they were basically saying, like, one of the main reasons is, it is actually one of the problems with using electronic stuff is, people will start with a chord progression nowadays, and I do it myself when I write songs, I'm like, oh, I really like this chord progression, and then the melody becomes the afterthought, whereas, mm. like, years mm. and years ago, back in the 60s, people wrote a melody first, and then they thought, what chord works with this melody? Yeah, right. And they created their chord progressions that way. Whereas, like, nowadays, like, if you start with, like, your four chords, you're going to go to, like, probably those notes, you're not going to, like, so if you start on a C, you're going to go C, E, or G. You're not going to think to go to a B or some other note and create a weird chord underneath it, or you're not going to think to, like, uh, you know, you might you mightn't think of the same chords to start from. And, yeah, so melody has kind of died with, like, modern pop, like, and it's, like, it's strange. I, I, it's, it's, it's like you can get like chord generators now mm. and just yeah. yeah and just <laughs> press a button and there's your chord sequence as well yeah. but like if you can still use all those tools and come up with something cool as oh well. yeah you yeah, can, yeah, yeah. yeah you can it, everything is there getting back to what we were saying earlier like you know as is is it um is it a advantage uh, is there advantages in everything yes is there disadvantage yes yeah, uh, you that's, know yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Life. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's and it's still it's still down to a personal taste and yeah. you know so nothing has really changed <laughs> yeah, yeah. Changed. yeah but of course remember the whole kind of repetition thing comes in so mm. if a, a tastemaker decides something is going to be the sound mm. and it's one of the big organizations behind it all of a sudden it's repeated 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 yeah so yeah. it gets into your subconscious and then that you have to you nearly accept something is cool because you're being told it's cool yeah. Although they can't tell you that they're telling you it's cool, because then therefore it's not cool. Yeah. But the the constant repetition, you know, can make that with certain mm. people. Certain, yeah. You know what I mean? And obviously we're looking at major promoters and major labels there, and even those that blur what's a major promoter, what's a major label, you mm. know, because you have major promoters releasing records now. Mm. So do you, do you and this is like with the major labels now, and this is more so in America, but like obviously it's. Um, do you feel like there's this there's this new wave with like it's the younger music as well like um do you know maybe people about four or five years even younger to me but like there's this like and I know it and it's like I don't know it's just there's songs now that are like making like depression and stuff seem cool I don't know there's this really weird thing going on like I don't know how this is but like you see it a lot and if you listen to the lyrics in like a lot of um more so the kind of um 
some, not all, of uh, the hip hop tunes in America at the moment. Mm. It's just a really weird thing, and I don't know, maybe it's just the way I'm seeing it, but um, I've talked to a few people about it though, and they're seeing the same thing, but like, there seems to be like this really weird thing in all the new songs. I don't know, do you know what I'm talking about? Or do you feel that way? But if you, generally, around the uh, depression and the zeitgeist, then music comes with that. So yeah. it might be a turning point that people are fed up with what's going on across the board, yeah. politically, um, with like the lack of jobs, you know, like the homeless crisis and all that. And people are generally putting that those thoughts, capturing and putting into the music. Mm. Because, you know, for a lot of people yeah. in a lot of areas, it's very depressing at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and music, the best music is generally made out of <laughs> out of depression, out of yeah. depression yeah. and yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah you know yeah. I agree Jeff with Buckley, that like. as well but my, my, the thing is like yeah it's like uh, Jeff Buckley like made some and his lyrics were kind of poetic but when does it come in line when you're talking about depression but are you're literally telling kids to take pharmaceutical drugs and stuff mm. like because mm. like, that's what a lot of hip hop in America now is kind of doing maybe I don't know I just not too gone on Maybe like I don't know. Maybe I just seen the scene. But it could be weird. kind of it could be done in kind of a protest way of like if someone is wants to give out with the fact that when they have mental health problems they're just throwing Xanax. Like yeah. then the best thing they can do is just go, oh yeah, fuck it, yeah, let's just tell everyone to take Xanax. So it could be done in like a protest way. They might not actually mean it. These literally. guys are all on Xanax. Like, I know, but like they, I don't know. I don't listen to enough of it, so it's yeah. hard, it's hard to know if it's like it's kind weird. of just a scene thing that. You know, like, these guys are all like they've they've um, they're young. Like I I blame the NWA. They got what they wanted. <laughs> 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 you know, the censorship was taken away. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? but I uh, know maybe yeah. But you're getting into that territory where mm. you know, are we allowed freedom of speech? Yeah. And all oh that no, kind for of stuff. sure. Yeah, I'm yeah. not trying mm. to say that. Just I'm just curious to like that, that genre has always been a. It has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fair. Um, yeah, I guess so. There's just less words now. <laughs> like some some, <laughs> some people tackle censorship <laughs> by being like kind of that kind of really out there and yeah. telling people to do things like especially yeah, in, in, yeah, yeah, not so much yeah. in English music but in German music like if you listen to like some of the songs that are made to combat censorship in Germany like the, you translate the lyrics and you don't want to like be yeah. listened to because you're just like that's fucked up like it's up, like people riding dogs and all this kind of just really really kind of as far as they can push it and put just like yeah if you're not gonna if you're gonna censor our song our good song in the radio we're gonna make all this really weird stuff <laughs> just yeah, to yeah. just to show you i don't get like that's just other countries seem to do a lot more so it could be part of that as well it's hard yeah. to fully understand yeah i know at the end of the day like it's, it's there's definitely be no censorship sure there. marilyn manson was the same thing you yeah. know you know and the the uproar he made at the time and mm. he broke an awful lot of boundaries hey, um did, have you seen the defiant ones on netflix no, oh, we, I, we you spoke you know, about this, and I don't think I ever looked I think, at that. Uh, oh no, I think there's no, some lead maybe yeah. showing yeah. the course, but yeah. um, it's really good. But it just talks about it's all Interscope Records, but it just talks about how at the same time NWA were causing uproar. There was like Trent Reznor being the way he was, mm. stage, and then there was Marilyn Manson, just all these lads just doing crazy stuff. The videos the Trent Reznor's had, sorry, the videos, yeah, did, oh yeah, man, they're crazy. amazing. They're, yeah. But yeah, they, this all went down at the same time, which was kind of like, it nearly feels like, because well, NWA and all them, that's, they, 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 they got it, like they got the, they did kind of, as collectively, and nearly, but Interscope Records, it felt like they were so, only signing people at the time who were fighting against censorship, I don't know what it was, but it's a really good documentary anyway, but um, yeah, no, it's, it definitely wouldn't, I agree censorship shouldn't be censored. Yeah. Censorship should be censored. Yeah. Censorship, the only thing that should be censored. Um, well, yeah, um, I'd love to get your. So, you're doing um, an interview in, yes. uh, up in Dublin in the STC College, which is on in Temple Bar. It is in Temple Bar on the 6th of March. 6th of March, and it's called In Conversation with Phil Harden. Phil Harden. So, what's the premise of, like, what's the idea of this show? The, the, yeah, uh, great question. The reason, um, and this was the idea of, uh, of, of having Phil over here, is Phil was is um, a producer. He's actually probably started off as a rock producer, but he became a pop producer throughout his career. And um, actually, as part of that event, what, what he's going to do, he's actually going to, uh, somebody who attends that night um, uh, we'll be getting a one-to-one consultation with yeah. with oh, a kind cool. of a view of giving yeah. you know advice of you mm. briefly just explain oh, sorry, in conversation yeah. you're in conversation you're a new it's a new show you're doing isn't oh it? sorry yeah so the idea is that um, I'll be interviewing experts and specialists who've achieved huge success yeah. in the music industry different sides different angles and uh, Phil is the first one mm. and he of course has said he comes from that rock pop producer yeah. background. So, you know, to start name dropping acts that he's worked with. So he would have worked with The Clash, uh, The Pesh Mode, um, Pet Shop Boys, um, 
uh, Erasure, Kylie Minogue, E17, famously, of course, on Stay Another Day. It's a nice paycheck from every year. Um, <laughs> he, he had a lot to do with the synthesizer sounds and all that kind of stuff. Huge on a huge amount, amount to do yeah, with the synthesizer yeah. sound. And he would have done an awful lot of work with, of course, Stock Aiken Waterman, PWL, that mm. record label. And there's one of the things I was listening back to when he was interviews as preparation for what I was going to be asking. I forgot it. you were doing this interview a minute ago because I was asking deck questions. I went into the interview mode. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, I was uh, gonna, so, put me back on that. I was going to ask you for advice, actually. About <laughs> that. And, uh, no, genuinely, like, you, you've loads of experience with the radio and stuff, and I'd love to mm. get your advice on this so I can look it back. Be as critical as possible. What can we do to make us better? We'll get back to So, I have to do a grading process on this. Yeah, yeah do oh it God. as quick, and then we'll get <laughs> yeah, back to yeah, your. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds good. No, but. So the idea is, um, like in one of his interviews, he said, I love the line, something like he said that Simon Cowell was a bit of an annoyance. You yeah. know? <laughs> so in terms of what would happen with the in conversation, obviously we're going to look at the key elements that's helped him have so many number ones. Like as a producer, he's produced records that have went on selling in excess of 50 million. It's incredible. You know, yeah, wow. that's it's massive. It's incredible, yeah. It's yeah. absolutely massive, mm. you know. Um, and one of the things that I like about him is his name or his title is actually Dr. Phil and it's not one of those honorary doctorates but rather it's a proper PhD mm, so okay. this is a guy who is very successful in the industry and then is also very successful academically mm. and the kind of questions that will go up will look at the patterns of behaviour the stuff that he did to generate you know this huge success but also there's going to be the angles of the kind of some of the questions that we, we touched on as in to, you know, he would have dealt with music managers such as like Tom Watkins, who was a very colourful manager yeah. back in the day. Um, he actually would have done work with Louis Walsh, of course, because he did some stuff with Boys on Way Back. I think he co wrote stuff with um, Ron Keaton, actually. But so we'll kind of look at sort of the what it was like dealing with some of the managers and what their demands were yeah. for artists. Same with the labels and what the labels wanted, some of that stuff, as well as the kind of, if you want to say, what we've already spoke about, the ingredients of having you know, a, a pop hit, a number mm. one record, you know, um, which he repeated over and over again, you know, yeah. so, so it, yeah, I can't wait. And what, what day is that? So people can actually kind of go attend this, so it's... They can attend, it's yeah. on Friday the 6th of March, and it's at 7pm in Temple Bar, yeah. and uh, so basically what it is, it's a series of questions on some online forums, including this one, I've actually asked people, what would you ask this guy, what questions would you ask, so some of those would be asked, but then because there's going to be a live audience there, um, they can there'll be a Q&A session yeah. at the end so they can ask whatever they want I would imagine what will happen is probably fans of certain acts will come along mm. and they'll uh, ask yeah. what was it like working with you know say the, the, the Clash or whatever or, or or what was it like working with Rick Astley or Kylie Minogue do you know yeah, that kind yeah. of way so that, I would imagine there'll be a certain amount of that but then there'll be people who are producers who want to know well, what's it, what was it like to you know, mm. you know how did your production change over the years because he's still an active you know, producer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, is it, like, is it, it's what's funny is there's still an, like if you listen to any of his records, there's an element of the sound like you can you, you almost know it's his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? And yeah. it's his ear, and it, it like for a lot of producers, yeah. um, like it's it's their sound that gets it gets through. Like Rick Rubin, yeah. like you know it's yeah, Rick, Rick Rubin, you know you know, know that kind of sound. thing, and 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 you know it's after being produced by him. Yeah. Well, before he became the secondary producer, you know, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, 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 yeah. like when he was hands on, and it's the same with himself. Um, and it is, is it just their ear? Yeah, yeah it is, yeah. I think. Yeah. And yeah. that they capture for a period of time what it is for, dare I use the cliche, a number one record. Mm. You yeah. Know? Mm. Um, and is it like, and probably with Stock Aiken and Waterman, there was an element of that they had a formula and they stuck with the formula. Oh, until absolutely. It, until, yeah. it, until it stopped working. Until it you changed, know? yeah. Um, so I think that's interesting. I think it's interesting because we'll get different perspectives from him from when he would have been just an engineer, just an engineer, I don't mean just an engineer, when he was an engineer to yeah. being a producer, to being a remixer, to how things have changed. You know, like nowadays, how much is done online where he never even meets the artists. You know, that whole phenomenon, mm. you know, yeah. which I think is kind of crazy too, you know, that somebody mm. records an engineer's the music sent over to the producer. That's great. And it's sent back, it's, if you're in a time zone, it's sent back, it seems instantly you mm. go to bed and the, the final yeah. product is there the next yeah, day. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, Kind of crazy, you know. So really looking forward to it. He's actually coming over. Am I allowed to plug a TV show that he's doing? Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. He's doing we'll um, invite him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's doing he's doing he's doing um on Virgin Media One, he's doing a TV show on um Thursday the twentieth of, of March. So that'll give an insight 
into what he's going to talk about as well. Now, obviously, he, he is a or book is it out. Or 20th of February? Or mm. Sorry, did I say March? Yeah. 20th of February. What's, na- what's, the, what's the name of the t- TV show? It's the... Uh, I should get paid for this. You should get paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, get, I feel there's an invoice coming around. <laughs> <No>. uh, <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, yeah, it's... Sorry, I'm glad you said that. It's Thursday, <laughs> the 20th of February. Yeah, he's doing a TV show to promote the event after the event. Yeah. Uh, that would be really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Thursday, the 20th, it's called The 6-1 Show on Virgin Media 1. Cool. Um, and it would be available I would imagine online and this show, you know, show is a cool idea this in conversation you're doing is yeah. this going to be like um, monthly or is it just kind of as as it goes I would suspect it'll be maybe sort of three or four times a year as opportunity arises okay, yeah. um, there's a certain label th- uh, that we, we've been speaking to now I'm saying we um, Anthony Sullivan um, who runs As Written um, and myself are involved in this so we're speaking to a certain label so kind of when certain releases are coming out with people who have had success okay. we might do sort of in conversations based on their experience so it could even be the next one could be an artist who was successful for a certain time period and they come and they talk about that success period yeah yeah so there could be some very interesting ones there as well it'll be it'll be interesting to see in the in conversation style events people tend to be very honest and i, yeah. I like that mm. Whereas sometimes when you're doing TV and radio, they're less honest. Wait, the, are these going to be recorded, right? Or is it just kind of live conversations? Um, it's going to be it's it's going to be a live in conversation, um, and yeah, yeah, just recorded. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I do think there's a difference. I think uh, will it be like like cause it, what kind of where we're going for with this and like uh, you can kind of tell with the uh, kind of what you can with say. The all over the place as well though. Like it's like uh, <laughs> trying to do and try and go for the national conversation because. I was even watching like um, some interview and like, do you know, it was just a normal, it wasn't even just TV, it was like a normal interview at a festival or something and it was kind of like, um, the way the questions were being asked were like, and it wasn't a very formal person and it didn't have to be a very formal interview, but it just felt very like, just you could hear it in the tone of voice that it was just like, someone like kind of turns on to, yeah. and, and I'm trying to get out of it because you kind of do it here even, <laughs> mm. but you kind of just switch and then you're like, your tone of voice changes and the stuff and yeah. I think, um, this changeover thanks to YouTube and stuff like that is that people are kind of talking with more like I don't know less kind of like uh, interviewing and stuff like so I think I think I think it's hitting off as well I think if RTE start taking that on as well I think you will start seeing that soon but um just a different approach to interviews and stuff like that because uh, as you said you get deeper in the conversation absolutely yeah uh, you get the yeah. honest answers yeah. you're not getting the same answers that the same person said in every other interview that they've yeah. done before well it, go back to censorship like the yeah, reality yeah. is um, there were some of the answers I gave you there and I, did, I deliberately didn't name the artist because yeah. it's not in the public domain so if anything I've said is in the, is in the public domain but yeah, yeah. there were other answers there that are not so therefore I can't say them mm. and again that's kind of like with the in conversation with Phil the reality is the live audience that are there, then like they're going to get if you like the real interview, you know. Make sure they're not wearing a wire. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Um, so, <laughs> so the the whole idea is, you know, they're going to hear the questions I'm going to ask. They're going to ask the, yeah. the questions, and that's I suppose the concept is that you know nothing. It's going to be. Um, what's it, a safe environment mm. yeah like you know in, that you can, people feel like they can they're involved, involved. Mm. They're, yeah. they're not watching the conversation yeah. they're within the conversation and, and I suppose I that's good. and that's kind of I suppose one of the objectives to do and I haven't gone to a few of those I find them incredibly enjoyable so you're so going to yeah. be a Twitter mouthpiece for the night <laughs> 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 this is it you know? so uh, but yeah again it's, it's great to talk I always think it's very good and interesting to talk to somebody who has worked with all these acts mm. and artists managers labels because yeah. the stories they have and the insights that they have is just absolutely phenomenal yeah. you know mm-hmm. it's the um, stories they don't tell is what you want to hear yeah 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 you also know some of the stories as well that you can't tell about oh uh, I know after when the when, yeah. when, when, when the <laughs> team stopped recording you know? yeah. I know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. He doesn't know about the GoPro in the corner. <laughs> I, I sincerely hope they weren't recorded before we started recording. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you won't yeah. get into a lot of trouble there. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, do you have any advice for us going forward as someone who has loads of experience? Because you, you've done radio and stuff. I did. Well. I did. That's a long Jeez, you've done your research. Oh, yeah. You I really did. have. You know? <laughs> it's a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, gee, that's over 10 years ago. Um, it was it was a kind of it was a music industry guy thing that I was doing where I used to kind of break down elements of the music industry and say say you're starting off act I was saying well look these are, these are kind of the, the sort of the ten steps that you should do to get your house in order mm. 
and it was everything from registering you know with various royalty bodies to how to make sure if you're recording something that you did yeah, right. yeah. you know it was it was all the way all the way through to promotion that's the biggest one and anyone who's listening or interested in, in music marketing promotion when you think i commented and i don't often i commented on a, on a group last night um i wouldn't be a keyboard warrior because i think there's absolutely no point i think it's wasteless you're mm-hmm. making yourself look like can you say twat? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you just some, did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like kind of, um, and I just said to, to, to this, this person about, you know, would you, would you, the question was something along the lines of, would you do more promotion or merchandise? And I said, well, look, focus on the promotion. Mm. I mean, you think you've done enough start again as if you've done none. Yeah. And, um, you know, and kind of actually with the merch, I said, well, look, if it's, if it's, it's a kind of, is it a UK tour? I think they're doing an Irish UK tour. I was saying, well, obviously you're going to have a great design poster. So if you have no other merch, have some posters to sell. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Go for something that ain't going to cost you massive money. But the key point I was trying to say was promote, 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 because you can never promote enough, particularly yeah. starting mm. off. Mm. So it was the music industry guide was, that I was doing with the radio was very much based on, on kind of sort of those points. And having been through the mail and like some lo- loads of things I did were hugely successful, but the opposite was also true. Do you know? Yeah. It's just only mm. talk about the success. Mm. But yeah. <laughs> but do you count? Do you count an equal or more amount of value between the ones the failures or success? That is a great question. That is a fantastic question. Um, the reality is, from a lot of the failures, is where you know success lied. Yeah. After mm. I worked with a band. A great, I'm going to name them. They were called the Fundamentals, and we had this song coming out, a single coming out. It was called Brother, and it was released over a decade ago. And we got a remix yeah. done of this. It was done in, um, um, it was done in London, remastered, remix, all this stuff, different from the album version. So we we thought we'd all grounds coverage, you know, a new version of songs so people would want the new version, not the yeah. album version, you know. Uh, it was a bit edgier, and um, I genuinely thought that was going to be a top thirty uh, hit single. Possibly 20, and if we we're really lucky and got the, the, the right week, it's going to be top 10. Mm. Yeah. Well, that was my first top 62 hit single. And <laughs> <laughs> um, it may or may not have ever moved from top yeah, 62, yeah. you mm. know? And that was, at the time, I was absolutely gutted. I was mm. gutted. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Now, we, could, we had a tour and it was branded, it was a branded The Brother Tour and all the rest of it. So we continued on, we did it. You know, it was fine. It worked. Yeah. But in terms of the disappointment for that, and it was really about kind of getting sort of the house and gear for the next release. Yeah. And the next release then that I worked on was actually with a guy called James O'Connor. So that top 62 from the fundamentals turned into a, a number nine hit for him. Yeah, you know yeah, so yeah. Do, you, do you see where I'm going that's so great. that's really cool I yeah that. that's and, nice. and there wasn't that massive we're talking I think maybe about six months to a year you yeah. know to, to to reform and get a, mm. get a great strategy together yeah, and that's cool. and it worked but it was the learning curve that you learned that mm. you were able to bring on and move on yeah. Like, yeah and that's the key because when that happens going back to let's talk about the mental health thing by jeez when you have a top 62 when you think you're going to have a top potentially top 10 that's yeah, good wrenching. Yeah. Now, bearing in mind, let me point out, I was then lecturing on the music industry to students. Yeah. Very visible that yeah, I'm yeah. saying, oh, this is probably going to be a hit. You know? Now, look, I'd never be that arrogant, to be fair. Yeah, but yeah. you're kind of saying, we're hoping to have a bit of success with this mm. and all the rest of it. So it's a bit of a step down when you have to go into that class the next week. Yeah. Do you know mm. what I mean? It's humbling. It's, it, it's humbling. Mm. But to be fair, I think in any learning environment, even students understand that there's ups and downs, particularly in the It's a good lesson industry. for them, like literally. Mm. Like, but that's it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, actually, I turned, I turned a lot of that into lessons in certain classes and, yeah. I, and I showed, um, you know, the kind of the variables and all the rest of it. What was annoying at the time was I had already had quite a number of chart records and I dropped, I dropped my guard mm. at that stage. Yeah. And that was probably the big mistake I think that I made mm. do you know yeah what I mean? yeah um, so it goes to show don't <laughs> don't drop your yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> promote yeah. yeah. climbing climb things and holding yeah it reminds me of what's your man's name he's in the band Airborne I think he's Joe O'Keefe or something or he's like he's some Irish links but they're Australian 
and um, they had to like stop uh, stop a festival, like let kind of let it die and like get them down because you know the like what's you call it the rigging or whatever around the stage, the truss yeah, yeah. up above. Yeah, yeah, he climbed up that, got up on top, and started playing a guitar solo. Having this is the thing he does at loads of different festivals, it's like kind of one of his things. <laughs> but at one particular festival he was doing it, they were just like, no, we can't do that, we can't do that. They just tur- they just like turned everything off or to get them down, yeah. get them down right yeah. now. Well, <laughs> And yeah. territories are different. Like, for example, you know, um, there's different rules and regulations in this country. Like, if you're a touring act, so some of that might be part of your show mm. in England or Ireland or whatever, that's fine. But then you go to America and you try and throw the apple off the stage. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that's yeah, not yeah. going to be allowed. And it, there's, there's all sorts of, like, complexities. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, and you'll know productions nowadays, there's nobody out there. You know, even the acoustic rock acts have a production. And that has huge implications mm. because of lighting and all the rest of it. Mm. Even to when an act can perform, you know. Yeah. Just like I helped, I went up to help. Uh, what was it? We had to help Ed Sheeran. Sheeran. Yeah, yeah. And was yeah. it? He had like seventeen trucks or something. And it was just mm. like it was just I mean, him. It was just one guy. It was just him. Started. And I know, yeah, there was a big, <laughs> massive yeah. production to the stage. Yeah, the idea yeah. is that like one guy with like two guitars and two microphones yeah. would need seventeen yeah. trucks for yeah. a production. It's like it's, it's insane. insane. Like, now, there's, there's something I have to say about Ed Sheeran, which I think is is is, is uh, always interesting to, to say about people who appear to be genuine. Um, there was a guy, oh, genuine, <laughs> non, non-spoiler, I like, know next week, man. Back to Ed Sheeran next week, and more secrets on Oasis. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, there was a guy, the guy who showed him uh, how to use the loop pelts from Port Leach, a guy called Gary Dunn, he runs the Irish London Centre, and uh, I remember I bumped into him a couple of years ago, just before Gary, or uh, Ed had done the gig in the London Irish Centre. I don't think he was even announced at this point. And um, he never forgot that Gary showed him how to play the loop pedal. And he agreed to do this gig in a small, smallish, smallish venue, a couple of hundred people. Um, now, can you imagine the attention that the London Irish Centre got wow. when Ed Sheeran yeah. mm. did that gig? Mm. And that was out of friendship and a loyalty, which is kind of going back to what we were saying mm. about being yeah. fair. Ed Sheeran doesn't need to do any of that for anyone. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, and I think it's a, a huge quality. Yeah. Do they need to change the chart rules so that Ed Sheeran isn't one to twenty when he puts out a new album? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I felt sorry for any act that had mm. anything out that week. Mm. You know, and in a fifteen, and in a fourteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, what, what are, I thought it was strange because like, you usually hear complaints like that if an artist is taking over the charts but yeah. one, one person I noticed not many people complained about how many singles they released was Hosier like he released like six or something sim- singles from the first album I know it was like a dub- basically a double album but like the fact that it was like there was like six different sim- singles everyone was just kind of like when's the next one coming out no one was complaining that he was over I think, oh, I think yeah. it's because there was more variance in it whereas like a lot of artists tend to have like Kind of the, the the range of what they sound like on on an album is yeah. kind of narrower, but because like Jackie Wilson didn't sound like uh, uh, kind of didn't sound like Take Me to Church and didn't sound like some of the other mm-hmm. stuff, people didn't get sick of it as quick. I just thought it was really interesting because I, I usually notice people give out about someone having that many um, singles. Out. Interesting you touch on. I suppose like um, I'm pretty much that. Um, what time is it now? We finish up now. Is it? Jesus. Wow. Well, okay. yeah. well, this is going to be like a part one series or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three episodes. Yeah, thanks a million for coming down. Uh, well, yeah, the event for anyone uh, watching that wants to go to um, the event, where is it on again? It's on it's in, um, SDC in Temple Bar and what day is it on? Uh, Friday the 6th of March at 7 o'clock. You'll get all the details on the Eventbrite page and all you need to put in there is uh, Phil Harding Phil Harding or Phil Harding Dublin yeah. and it will come up and you'll see the, you'll see the, yeah. the link oh, also like this uh, where it's on SCC Sound Training College like uh, it's where I did a festival management course like just like if like as well as going to that event like just seeing this place is like you'd be kind of blown away that there is like these kind of um, I suppose like facilities to learn uh like it isn't I think when people think of college and stuff and more simply people my age who haven't gone to college and stuff who might because many people are interested in music like when you kind of get to see this place to like do you know what's out there and um, the facilities to actually get into the industry and stuff and there's a great there's a great live sound course there a great recording course yeah. and a video course there as well performance course performance course yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. really cool like yeah. um yeah, definitely. It's just like uh, it's absolutely. I just hope the check is in the post, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a cheat code into the, especially the festival, festival management course is a cheat code into the, into the festival mm. industry. Like, yeah. um, you're just gonna 
leapfrog over the bastards as they say yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. no again they're, they're very strong in those partnership yeah. courses whether it's the Institute of Art Design Technology mm. in Dunleary or in the case of the festival one which is I think the one you did was yeah. Longford West Mead ETB at Lowen yeah and yeah. the Dublin one is, is Dublin Dunleary Education Training yeah. so it's good it's good that there's these very strong links i.e. what I'm trying to say is they're all great validated yeah. courses yeah. 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 So, um, so you have this huge industry expertise from the from the mm. from the staff there, yeah, um, but definitely from the festival management point of view, anyone who wants to have a career at festival management, they get it once once they've done that course. Mm. Yeah, Ultimately, no doubt, be, like you know, um, so they do a great job of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah thanks, William, for coming on. Um, Thank you for having me, folks. Yeah, mm, that was great. great. Yeah, good. To, uh, good to see you again as well. Likewise. Um, yeah. Uh, if anyone, if it, if you want to find out why actually why we started this podcast, it was in case I'd lose my wallet. And if anyone in Toronto has seen my wallet, uh, yeah, just I don't know, email the podcast or something. Uh, sound uh, thanks to Decky and Stevie for coming on as well uh, thanks to Lysa and Brendan for doing camera stuff thanks to Lucy for letting us use the green sheep um, yeah thanks to the people who put down oh yeah do, do you know this is actually the maddest thing ever I'm going to end it on this uh, my grandfather actually knows the, the, the man that invented the uh, cat's eyes on the road ah go away yeah uh, we should have him on sometime uh, see you see you next week <laughs> that's everything from nothing thanks for Oh. oh, nice and two hours late. Oh, hell, like, that was That's crazy. That's a really tough job for you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two parts. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs>